in Revelation 2, from which we read our scripture lesson earlier together, verse 7 contains a very precious promise that Jesus made to some Christians living long ago. A promise which I believe we will see has application also to Christians living today. Verse 7 of chapter 2 of Revelation, I'll read from the NIV. The Lord says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Paradise. What a word of rich associations. This word I don't hear as often as I used to, used in a secular way, but we used to hear it quite a lot. People would speak about this person is in paradise. They felt as though they were just in a wonderful situation. It was paradise to them. Several centuries ago, a very famous English poet and writer named John Milton, a man, by the way, who also was blind, like the man in the song, wrote a book, in fact, two of them, that became very famous in our language. One of them was Paradise Lost, and also he wrote a book called Paradise Restored. John Milton, the famous blind poet, who lived during the time of Shakespeare. Some of you may have read some of his writings at one time or another. The word paradise, very interesting word, a word which we see here as we just read, is associated with a hope, with a promise. Jesus is saying here that some are going to be given the opportunity of being there, being in paradise, where he says is the tree of life the privilege of being in paradise. The question comes then, what is paradise? It's a word which I say is not used a lot. It's not even used a whole lot in the Bible, but it is used a few times. We would like to look at those this morning to see if we can understand better what it is that the Lord was promising here to those who would be there in the paradise of God. What does it really mean? This word is really a, a word that comes, it isn't really a Hebrew word, although it is in the Old Testament. It's actually a Persian word. And it had entered, we, the archaeologists discovered, into many of the languages of the Middle East, including Hebrew, was a Persian word. And I'd like to read some of the places in the Old Testament where that Persian word is actually found in Hebrew. For example, in the book of Ecclesiastes it's found, if you'd turn with me, and we'll see exactly how it was used long ago. Ecclesiastes 2.5. The writer of this book, many feel that it was Solomon, calls himself the, the son of David, which could mean any descendant of David who happened to be king in Jerusalem. This king tells us in verse 4, I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself, planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs of wa to water groves of flourishing trees. And he goes on and on and on and tells us about the great projects that he had constructed and built. At the end of all that, he felt that maybe some of this was folly because he didn't find all the pleasure in these things that he had hoped to find. Interestingly enough, in verse 5, where he said, I made gardens and parks, 
The word garden is the regular Hebrew word for garden that is also used in Genesis 2 of the Garden of Eden. But the word park is the word pardesh or paradise. He made himself some paradises. And in these paradises, he says, he planted all kinds of fruit trees. He even had some reservoirs of water to water them. We also find in the Song of Solomon that this word is used in the fourth chapter in the third ver 13th verse. I just want to look at these verses to see how the word was used. He says here, your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with choice fruits, with henna and nard. And he goes on describing a beautiful picture of a garden. But the word orchard, translated orchard here, again is paradise. Your plants are a paradise of pomegranates. The word is used one more time in the Old Testament in Nehemiah. This time it's not poetry, it's a straightforward historical description. It's found in Nehemiah, the second chapter. Recall for a moment the historical situation of Nehemiah. It was the time when the exiles of the Jewish people were being allowed to go back from Persia to the land of Israel to rebuild their city of Jerusalem. But to rebuild it, they needed supplies, they needed timber, they needed uh, stones to make the walls and so on, and the buildings. And here in Nehemiah 4.13, we read that some of this was going to come. Let's see, I wonder if I have the right verse here. I'm sorry, it's Nehemiah 2.8. I guess I had announced that earlier. He says, may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple, and for the city wall, and for the residence I will occupy. This is Nehemiah speaking about the needs that he has in order to rebuild the temple, or to rebuild the city, the wall, the gates, and even a place for him to live. The interesting thing is that he's talking about the king's forest. In verse 8 here we read, he says that he needs timbers to make beams for the gates of the citadel from the king's forest. Again, the word forest in this case is the word paradise. From the king's paradise, I would like some trees to make timbers, to build. We see then that the word had a very literal meaning. It had to do with a park, a forest, where trees were grown. In fact, the archaeologists tell us that they have found this word in all manner of ancient inscriptions to describe the places that the kings would build for themselves. They would wall in a great park. They would let deer loose in this great area, have beautiful trees and streams and lagoons or reservoirs of water, and there they would go with their nobles to hunt. Those places were called paradises by the kings and by the people. About 300 years before Jesus our Lord was born, there were many Jewish people living in Egypt in Alexandria, in Egypt. The language that was spoken at that time in that country was, strangely enough, not Egyptian, although there were those who still could speak it, but Greek, because Alexander, the great conqueror of the, of, from the Greek nation, had conquered Egypt a couple of centuries earlier, 
and had made Greek the language of Egypt. So the Jews living in Egypt at that time, about 300 B.C., were speaking Greek. But their Bible, the Old Testament, was written in Hebrew. Many of those Jews could not speak Hebrew, just like there are Jewish people today who do not know their, lang their ancient language of Hebrew. They speak the language of the country where they live. Some of them do learn Hebrew, of course, but it's not their language unless they live in Israel. There they have revived the ancient Hebrew language. What did those Jews do in Egypt? They felt the need for an Old Testament in their own language, just like we feel the need for our Bible in English so we can read it. So they translated it from Hebrew into Greek so that they could read it. That translation is called the Septuagint, which comes from a word meaning 70. Seventy men were involved in that translation, according to the historical records. So they called it the 70, the translation of the Old Testament from Hebrew to Greek. But it's very interesting what they did when they translated Genesis 2, 8 and 9, which Aaron read at the beginning of the service this morning. I'd like to read it from, I'll read it in English, of course, but I'm going to make one little change, changing it as they did in the Greek translation from the Hebrew. Now the Lord God had planted a paradise in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the paradise were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Did you notice the change? Our Bible says garden, but they had put the word paradise, which they had learned long before, a word which had entered the Greek language, had even entered the Hebrew language, as we saw, had entered a lot of other languages of the Middle East, and had come to it described very graphically that kind of place where there were beautiful trees, water, a place where it was a delight to be, a real garden spot, a real forest, as we like to go out into the mountains, into the forest. Beautiful place. Some of you have been up to British Columbia and seen some of the beautiful gardens up there in Victoria and in Vancouver. Gorgeous places where people love to go and see the plants, the flowers, the trees, the beautiful lawns and all of that. This is the word that expressed, it seemed best of all to these people, that kind of an idea. So they chose that word, paradise, to express that place where man and woman were first placed when God created them. Also in chapter 3 of Genesis, they did the same thing in verses 23 and 24. So the Lord God banished him, banished Adam, from the paradise of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And he drove the man out. He placed on the east side of the paradise of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. The tree of life, which was there in the paradise of God. Is it any wonder then, when our New, New Testament was written, that that very word paradise was taken over and used to describe what had been called in the Old Testament the paradise of God, the Garden of Eden, where the tree of life had been 
and where it was lost by our first parents. This word paradise occurs then three times in the New Testament. Brought right over into the Greek New Testament as it had been brought into the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, 300 years earlier. Turning back again to Revelation 2, notice that same picture that we saw in Genesis. Jesus promises the right to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. What then is the paradise of God? Well, we have seen that it was the Garden of Eden, the paradise of Eden, a paradise which was a literal place right here on the earth. It wasn't off somewhere else on some other planet or up in outer space. It was a literal beauty spot right here on the earth where the tree of life was growing. That place is mentioned later in Revelation, not with the word paradise, but in another way. Please look with me at Revelation 22 and verse 2. And I'll read with beginning in the first verse. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. The word paradise isn't mentioned here, but the tree of life is that it is going to be in this place described as a place where the throne of God and the Lamb will be and where there will be clear, crystal clear flowing waters. If that's where the tree of life is going to be, then we are at liberty, it seems to me, to say that this has got to be the paradise of God because Jesus had already said in chapter 2, that that tree of life is in the paradise of God. So even though the word paradise is not used in chapter 22, it is used in chapter 2 of the same book, of the place where the tree of life will be. The paradise of God. But where is that going to be? What is John describing here in chapter 22? Well, he begins the description in chapter 21. And in verse 1, he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men. And he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. This is a description, then, of what he calls a new heaven and new earth, period, where the new Jerusalem comes down from God out of heaven. Presumably, if it comes out of heaven, it is no longer in heaven. That is to say, it is on the earth. Not the earth as it now is, but the earth as it will be when it is made new. For this same chapter says in verse 5, He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. I am making everything new. He is renewing or is going to renew all things. And certainly as we look at this earth of ours as it now is, has now been spoiled by pollution, contamination, and all the rest, we realize how desperately it needs to be made new, to be renewed, to be restored. And so this paradise which was lost 
I think Mel Milton very correctly spoke about it to be someday restored. That very word restored is used in the Bible in Acts 3, where Peter says that God will restore all things which he spoke about in his Old Testament by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Paradise restored. Not paradise someplace else, but paradise which is restored to the very place where it was once and has been lost, namely this earth. This earth. But a, an earth changed and transformed and renewed. This leads us then to believe that paradise was never meant to describe heaven as it so often is used by people today. They'll say, well, he died and went to paradise, meaning he died and went to heaven. But paradise in the Bible is not heaven. It's a heavenly place in a sense that it is a wonderful, beautiful, perfect place, but it's not in heaven. It's always described as on the earth. But a place that is so beautiful that was lost because of sin. And man was driven out because of sin, we read. But God has said he will restore. He will take away the curse that he placed on the earth. And that is also told us there in Revelation 22 where we read, in verse 3, no longer will there be any curse. That could never be said of heaven because heaven never was cursed. He is talking about the place that was cursed, namely the earth. And he says no longer will there be any curse. That will be gone. That will be taken away. But then we have a second reference to paradise in the Bible that we'd like to look at this morning, which is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This passage has occasioned a lot of speculation. It's one that we need to look at carefully. Paul is talking here to these Corinthians who are having problems with Paul's place of authority. He says, I must go on boasting, although there's nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. And then he goes on to speak about what he could say but is not allowed to say because it is not allowed to him to, to describe all that he saw. Many have thought probably Paul is describing his own self when he says, I knew a man in Christ. The reason we think that is that in verse 7 he says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations. Paul is apparently referring to the ones he had just mentioned in the earlier verses of the chapter. He speaks about being caught up to heaven, the third heaven, caught away or caught up to paradise. And I'm sure that this is the passage that has given people the idea that paradise is in heaven somehow. The problem is that the word caught up, for one thing, is not really there. It really means to be snatched away, the word that is translated caught up. Snatched away. Snatched away where? Could be up, but not necessarily. What about this third heaven? Does that mean that heaven is kind of like in tiers or floors? Is that what Paul is saying? 
Is he talking about heaven as having different levels and he's up on the third level? Is that it? If that's the case, it's a rather unusual, at least to say the least, scripturally unusual way to describe heaven. However, when we consider something else, namely what Peter says in 2 Peter 3, we find that there is a sense in which there is a third heaven, scripturally. Let's look at it. We must, because of time, rather rush through it, but I would ask you to study it carefully on your own. Beginning in verse 3 of chapter 3 of 2 Peter, Peter describes, first of all, the time before the flood. He reminds them that there was a time when the heavens existed, verse 5, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. He describes a time long ago, first of all, which he speaks of the heavens and the earth as they once were. He says that came to an end at the time of the flood. Then he says we now have the present heavens and earth, which he describes as being reserved for fire to the destruction of ungodly men. And then in verse 13, <clears throat> He says, in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. New heavens and earth. A third one. Not third in geography, but third in point of time. The first one was done away at the time of the flood. The second one is done away at the future fires of judgment. The third one never ends. It goes on and on. It's, he says, one that will be the home of righteousness, a new heaven and a new earth. The very one that John described in Revelation 21. He said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. What then can Paul mean there in 2 Corinthians when he says this person was snatched away, and that's the literal meaning of the word, to the third heaven, wherein, he says, was paradise, was snatched away to paradise. In light of these scriptures, I believe Paul is not talking about a geographical level. He's talking about a time. He says this man was snatched away into the future. Something like this back to the future thing, you know. Only it's much more beautiful than that because he was taken in vision to see that third heaven, that new heaven and earth, wherein will be the paradise of God, as we've already seen in Revelation. It's not as though he were taken up to the throne of God, which now is, but he's taken to the throne of God, which will be, which will be on the earth, as we've seen in Revelation 22, when God himself will dwell with men and be with the human race, then made perfect and be their God and wipe away all tears from their eyes. Paul was permitted to see this in vision and he was so enraptured by it, he didn't know whether it was physically removed or simply in his mind, whether in the body or out of the body. He didn't know. It was that kind of an experience. And he wasn't dead. He wasn't talking about a dead person. Like some would say, well, he died and went to paradise. Or he died and went to heaven. He wasn't talking about that. He was talking about a living person snatched away in vision, in revelation. He calls it visions and revelations in verse 1, in which he saw these things which are yet to take place in the future. It's as though there was a time warp and he was permitted to look far into the future and see 
as though he were there literally, that wonderful day when paradise will be restored. It's interesting that the word paradise in the New Testament always has the definite article in front of it, the. It does there in Revelation 2, which is in the midst of the paradise. It also does here in, in first, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, in Second Corinthians, even though our English version doesn't say so, it simply says here he was caught up to paradise. Literally it says he was caught away to the paradise. It is the specific, well-known paradise. It's not just paradise as some indefinite term, but it is the definite paradise. And it's unfortunate that our translators here did not bring the word the over into our language, which is in the Greek text. The paradise. He says that he was caught away or caught up to the paradise. The one that's already revealed in Scripture. Not some imaginary paradise that men have constructed in their own minds, but it's the one that God has revealed in his word. There's one other usage in the Bible, in the New Testament, of the word. I'd like you to look at it, and tonight I'd like to go into that, and I'd like you to please come, because this is the most controversial usage of all. Jesus talking to the thief on the cross the day when they were both crucified. And there was another one there too, remember. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. That's the third and last usage. Again, it's the paradise. The question is, what did Jesus mean by that? Is paradise then in existence? It would look like it on the basis of our translation here. I'd like to ask you if you would come tonight, and we will look at that very carefully. What does it mean? What did Jesus promise this man? And how is it to be fulfilled? Or was it already fulfilled? Let's look at it. Jesus says, you will be with me in the paradise. Jesus is going to be there, wherever it is. This man is going to be there. And we notice that Jesus said to the Ephesian believers, to him that overcomes, he will get to be in the paradise of God and to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Let us look at that tonight, Lord willing, and understand what the Lord was promising, and what he has promised to us as well. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the marvelous promises that are in your word regarding your future plans for your people. And Father, we do pray that we may understand those plans and believe them and act upon them. Father, we thank you for the beautiful paradise that you established on this earth long ago. And Father, we regret the loss of that paradise. We desire the restoration of it. Not only that, but that we ourselves be restored to that condition of sinlessness and deathlessness that is, to be the, that is the promise and to be the inheritance of all your children. And so, Father, we look forward to the fulfillment of your promises, to the restoration of your paradise that you established and that will someday be reestablished. Go with us now from this service, we pray. Direct us and keep us and help us to be ready for that glorious future that you've promised. In Jesus' name.